Hi. Oh, can you shut me off in here? Yeah. So a couple of you guys have already rotated with me. Um, so it should be a review. If it's not, then good. You may maybe learn one or two things. If you haven't, then this will be really more to get you ready. Um, the, um, the talk on uh, we're going to do is on really a, is sort of a basic talk on lumbar spine anatomy, but it correlates with a lot, try to correlate a lot of clinical things into it. Um, and the thing, uh, Ryan, you put surgical anatomy, it's not yes. surgical um, because anybody who wor works with me is not going to be doing surgery. So um, how do I make this thing go? Just the eye. It's here. Oh, there we go. So if we're, I broke down four areas to talk about as far as uh, as far as spine anatomy and creating pain or and from a clinical context. So there's bone and joint, there's nerve, there's disc, and there's muscle. Um, you guys should all know what a typical vertebrae looks like. Um, there's five, right? <clears throat> there can be an extra one or less than one transitional anatomy where you have an extra lumbar vertebrae or you have minus one. I don't think that's necessarily clinically relevant, except <clears throat> when you're talking about levels and for procedures, you need to make sure everybody's numbering things consistently with the radiology uh, folks. And if they're going to have a procedure, make sure that we're we're treating the right level. That's why transitional anatomy may be Im important. But this is just a <clears throat> a lumbar. Uh, vertebrae whoop, back here just a typical lumbar vertebrae as you can see um, uh, you know the spinous process the transverse process uh, facet joint um, uh, vertebral foramen vertebral body but going back here um, can can bone hurt just itself you guys know if bone can hurt? Does bone hurt? You break a bone, does it hurt? <laughs> so but you can have bone pain. Um, so people can have fractures. If they have tumors, bone can hurt. And then there's also some belief that the end plate between the, um, uh, between the disc and the vertebral uh, body has nerve supply, and that can be a pain source. So the answer is bone can hurt. Why, why do we have, why is the spine anatomy or the vertebral body anatomy arranged the way it is, just is not random. It protects our neural structures, right? Um, restricts certain movements, so you, you, you can only move in certain planes. Uh, protects your nerves, as I was saying, and acts for muscle attachment. So all those things are important um, reasons why the vertebrae look the way they do. So again, that that's that's just a basic vertebrae, and then this is just showing this is just showing the intervertebral disc and the interface with the end plate, which is where I'm going right here with the pointer. So that's that does have nerve supply and can be painful, and so we'll we'll come back to what that might look like and why that might be relevant uh, in a little bit. So so you might ask yourself, well, you know, what what are maybe some red flags? And you'll you'll hear us use terms like red flags, but what are red flags for for bone pain? Do, does, does anybody know what you would worry about if if you thought somebody had these kind of symptoms, you would start thinking about bad things with bone? Worse than night, so nocturnal pain. What other kind of things? Step off. Step off would be more for for a uh, for a spondylolisthesis. So that itself is not really where, where I'm going at. How about so nocturnal pain is important. Inability to find a position of comfort. Uh, people that 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 can't find a position of comfort ever. You, that's a concerning red flag. And then if they have weight loss associated with those things, those would be those would be 
things you would worry about cancer diagnosis. Uh, the cancers that can go to bone are breast, prostate, myeloma, melanoma. Those are things that can go to bone. Is it common? No, but if somebody's if somebody's complaining of pain and they're losing weight and it's mostly at night and they can't ever get comfortable, that should just be on the radar. An x-ray would be helpful. Of course, MRI would be very sensitive for those things. So when we talk about uh, the bone, the, there can be painful end plates, and that's what I was referring to. Um, you might see abnormalities on an MRI that would clue you in. So you'll see when, when we look at MRI scans, um, particularly the STIR images seem to show stress between the disc and the bone. You'll see edema or swelling. Um, and that can be fairly sensitive to diagnose a painful segment. So when you see that, um, that's something that you should think about. Like maybe they have disc disc mediated pain. There's more and more evidence that that discs, although they do have pain receptors within them, may not cause just back pain alone. There can be um, problems associated with the end plate that also causes pain. Hence, there's a newer procedure that people are doing. I'm I'm not doing it where they uh, put a uh, uh, trocar through the through the pedicle into the center of the vertebrae and ablate the basivertebral nerve. Um, and that's a basivertebral nerve that's just depicting that particular procedure. You can see these nerves coming off of this neurovascular bundle called called the basic vertebral complex. And so so that will be something that um, I think more and more in the future uh, people will be doing to treat the bone aspect of pain. But it may not treat everything because it doesn't do anything to the disc itself. Um, so bone can hurt. You should think about injury mechanisms. So if it's traumatic, so you know the people that we see here would be snowboarders that are in the terrain park they catch air, they come down flat, um, and they have back pain. You'll see that several times in the winter, commonly uh, as a, a compression fracture. But then if they're atraumatic, the older population don't actually have trauma, and oftentimes they have fractures. So they're usually related to osteoporosis. But let's just say, for the sake of argument, that they're not even osteoporotic and they have a fracture and it's atraumatic, that's when you should start thinking about bad things. Um, you look at an x-ray, they don't have any, any history of osteoporosis, they have a compression fracture. Think about pathologic reasons, meaning underlying cancers and things like that. Uh, transverse process fractures are often traumatic. Generally, you don't do anything about them that's really symptomatic care, and then, in the in a younger population, spondylolysis, which would be things that you, as athletic trainers, have been taught and 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 exposed to, uh, the pars interarticularis can be a, a painful area. So it's more of a stress fracture kind of kind of situation. Um, people that have spondylolisthesis, as you mentioned before, Grace. They usually don't have pain just from that. It's the result of something that spondylolisthesis is doing. Is it creating stress in the facet joints? Um, is it is it unstable? Um, and then of course scoliosis is another thing where people you know can cause pain, not the curve itself, but the stress of the curve placed on um, on other structures. But so just to give you an example of 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 bone hurting. Um, this is a case I saw a few years ago where there was a, a patient that came in with a radiculopathy, which we'll talk about in a little bit. He had right, right S1 nerve root symptoms, and he came in with this radiculopathy and had had an MRI scan of his lumbar spine, and they treated him for a, a disc bulge at L5-S1, but they didn't really see, see this. Oops. This tumor that was sitting way down here in the sacrum, and all that is tumor, 
and that's into where his S1 root is. And and so the the MRI showed showed that, which was a big tumor at S1, S2, and everybody was focused on this L5 S1 disc. And he'd had some injections even before he had seen us. And they just sort of their eyes never went to that. Um, he's dead. This turned out to be a melanoma. Yeah, it was a bad, bad situation. Um, but uh, yeah, he did not need an injection. Um, he needed chemotherapy. Um, other things related to bones that can hurt would be your your facet joints. So they're synovial joints, as you guys know. They do allow movement and also restrict movement. That's part of their deal is they want to restrict motion in certain planes so you have stability. You can't bend any way you want to. Um, it's estimated that probably about 30% of patients that come in with low back pain, low back pain only, not radicular symptoms necessarily probably have facet pain. Generally, it's in an older population. Um, the What is the most common lumbar motion that you would utilize to uh, induce facet pain or facet symptoms well, on a physical exam? Rotation. So rotation and extension and also that also would be would be something that you might also do to induce pars pain because they're very close to each other. Um, so, so facets obviously can be painful. Um, most of the pain is with extension and rotation. However, some people will have pain with flexion. There's been studies that have have been done where where they did blocks on people with back pain. They had pretty normal looking discs, and they did blocks on the on the on the nerves that supply the joints and they had mostly pain prior to the blocks that occurred with flexion so you can't always just go by it's flexion hurts not extension but by far and away if, if somebody hurts with extension rotation that's probably more facetti um facets can be problematic because of spondylolisthesis in a lot of people they'll have spondylolisthesis that leads to facet arthritis. And that has to do with the fact that if you shift the vertebrae forward, you're putting more stress on the posterior elements and their reaction to that is, is, to, is to try to restrain that and often have a lot of stress and become arthritic over years of stress. Um, MRI can show inflammatory changes and I use regularly um, the stir images to look at at that. I think they're more visible. You'll see sometimes even synovitis. You'll see effusions and things like that. Um, and then sometimes you'll see facet cysts. Um, they're, I think, more common than than we think they're they are. Um, they become a bigger deal if they're compressing a nerve. Um, and and cysts can um, they're can compress nerves and give you ridiculous symptoms, just like a disc might. Um, uh, they, they're, they're similar to other cysts. So we have other synovial cysts that can occur in our body, right? We can get Baker cysts in the knees, we can get ganglion cysts in the wrists. So people think that they're tumors, the patients, but they're not. They're synovial cysts. They just occur off the joint. Um, so when I was alluding to earlier about getting blocks done, um, what is the name of the group of nerves that supply the lumbar facet joints? Some of you should know this for sure. The medial branches of the right. So they have a weird, the medial branches have a weird um, naming system. And I think it's really not, not as important to know the the reason that they're named, but you know, if you look look here, this medial branch comes across. That's the L4, even though it's on the L5 vertebral body. There's this medial branch that comes off of here, and it's right in this little notch between the sacral ala and the and the superior articular process of S1. 
That's the L5 dorsal ramus. Um, so if I'm treating facet pain at L5 S1, let's just say there's two nerves supplying that. There's the L5 dorsal ramus, it comes down and back up to the joint, and then there's the L4 medial branch. So whenever you're treating facets, you're always treating two nerves supplying each individual joint. And that's an important con uh, concept. Um, this is just showing a facet joint that's arthritic. You can see the joint on the right here. Remember, these are axial images, so that's the right side. And here's the left side, a hypertrophied facet joint right here. And then just a nice looking facet injection. Um, this is the L4-5 facet. You can just see a nice, a nice amount of a fluid or a nice amount of contrast in the joint. That's a oblique view of it, and then an AP view right there showing the contrast filling that joint. This person has had a laminectomy. That's why there's no bone sitting there. Right there. Um, so facet joints, there's medial branches of the dorsal rami, tech, that's the technical name. Two nerves innervate each joint, and they're in pretty predictable locations in the lumbar spine. When we talk about um, the innervation of the SI joint, they're much more random. So they're generally at the junction of the transverse process and articular process for that vertebral body, and they have a weird way of naming them. I think that's probably less important that you focus on on the, the numeric system, just knowing that there's two for each level, I think is, a, is important. Um, so we're gonna shift now to talk about um, other things regarding the vertebral body, the spinal canal. So do you guys know what the normal size of the central canal and lumbar spine should be? Around millimeters? Nine? 20? So third guess? 15. So, so because those two are pretty wrong, you're, you're closer to right. They're not really wrong. Um, so if somebody, the normal canal is 15 to 20. So somewhere in that range. Um, anything under 10 to 12 is considered to be stenosis. So nine would be stenosis. So 15 to 20 is, is pretty normal. I just look and see if they're 10 when I'm looking at an MRI. If they're greater than 10, I don't really consider that to be significant narrowing. If you look at an MRI and you see something like that, that's really bad stenosis. This stenosis is multifactorial, meaning bad facets with effusions on both sides. And, and this heart-shaped thing is ligamentum flavum. And that's super duper thick. And the canal is this little squished area here. And that is bad stenosis. And that often results from that, where people have a spondylolisthesis, ligaments thicken. So when people talk about stenosis, understand that there's multiple things collaborating to create the stenosis. It's not a, usually a standalone thing on its own. Some people can have congenital stenosis. So this is stenosis related to the ligamentum flavum, the shifting of L4 on L5, disc bulging, and all of that collaborates to create a very narrowed canal right there. And some stenosis in the level above, you can see that ligament thickening. Um, other, other things regarding joints, the sacroiliac joint um, uh, is a typical pain source. It's estimated about 15% of the patients that come in will have SI joint pain. I don't think SI joint arthritis is all that common. We see some, but SI joint pain is more common in people that are fused particularly fused down to the, L, the L5-S1 level is fused. That'll put stress on the SI joint. Um, is there a lot of movement in the sacroiliac joint? 
not a whole not a whole lot. It does move a little bit, um, uh, but it's not it's not all that mobile. Uh, true sacroiliitis. The, what is the the typical patient that might have ankylosing spondylitis? What would be sort of a typical um, maybe male or female? What do you think? So a typical a AS patient is usually their initial presentation might be sacroiliitis and they're usually male and they're usually in their 30s. Just just as a aside, doesn't mean other people can't have sacroiliitis or ankylosing spondylitis. Um, it's a spondyloarthropathy, it falls sort of under the rheumatologic category. Um, more, more common than that would be a uh, female that's pregnant developing sacroiliac joint pain. And why, why would that ever occur? So, so they get hypermobility, right? And why, why is their ligaments more lax? Chemicals, yeah, it's just, just drugs, yeah. right? <laughs> there's drugs, no, it's, it's, there's hormones, yeah. right? So there's a hormone called relaxin that's released um, to allow the pelvis to expand, right? To have a baby. So it's really pretty common for, for uh, pregnant women to get SI joint pain. So there's just a depiction of the SI joints bilaterally. It's the junction between the, the pelvis and the sacrum, and it's the joint that goes, and you can't really see it because the PSI is sitting right there. Uh, is, is superimposing over it. The, the reason that you'll see us target this lower area for injections is because this upper portion of the joint is not very accessible with, with the needle. Um, although last week I was trying to get a needle in the bottom of the joint, it what just wasn't flowing. And on this one particular patient, there was a loosened area to get a needle in up at the top. And I normally don't try that, but I did just, and it got in there. So sometimes you have to have to put uh, medicine into the other area, but in general, when I inject, it's this lower portion of the joint. So the, there's ligaments throughout the joint, and I'm bringing up ligaments because um, ligaments can be sources of pain, in fact, a lot of people think that the ligaments are the reason that the SI joints hurt or that area is, is painful. Um, what nerves uh, supply the input to the sacroiliac joint? So if the facets are the medial branches, lateral branches. So the lateral branches supply sacroiliac joint innervation. And so those lateral branches come out of, of, of what? areas. They come out of the neuroforamen. So S1 right here, S2, S3, and there's often one sitting right here at this junction of the, the L5 dorsal ramus also has some supply. Um, the, the thing that makes treating sacroiliac joint pain a little challenging is the fact that, that um, these these nerves, these lateral branches come in varying amounts in varying locations. And the right side doesn't always look like the left side. And between two patients, they don't always sit in this in exactly the same location. So when we're doing ablations, we're trying to capture as many, and I go along the ridge just adjacent to the superior articular process of S1, S2, and S3. And we also do the L5 dorsal ramus as well. Um, so lateral branch, the L5 dorsal ramus, S1, S2, and S3, highly variable in number and location. And they're embedded in ligaments. So, so they supply the joint. They supply the SI joint. This is just a depiction of the variation that you see from the S1 level, these little black lines or lines that, that they did a cadaveric dissection and they laid down little wires showing the nerve supply coming off of S1 on this particular cadaver 
and you can see how there's like five branches, maybe six or seven, and they they're so they they don't even st stay right there. They're like even coming down towards S3. So when we're doing lesions to burn the nerves, we just sort of come down, try to pick up as many as we can. We never really know how many, and they're and they're embedded in the ligament, so they come out of these nerve holes and embed in the ligament. And when we're doing ablations, we're actually not right sitting on the on the bone, just above embedded just above the bone where the probe is embedded in the ligament. Um, so so now we're going to we're going to change gears here a little bit. We were talking about nerves, but to the joints. But let's just talk about spinal nerves in general. So you have L1 to S3. They have motor and sensory function. They have a ventral ramus, dorsal ramus, and a dorsal root ganglion, right? So that's just sort of your typical nerve anatomy. This is just a cross-sectional view showing, showing the nerve root and then the spinal nerve and the dor the spinal nerve and the dorsal, the dorsal ramus coming off. And then this is the ventral ramus that is the nerve is the nerve supply to muscle, right? Um, and then this is the gray ramus, gray ramus communicans, which is more of a um, sympathetic nerve. I don't, we don't really do much involving in, involving that, but some people think they can also cause a sympathetic uh, dystrophy or CRPS. Um, There's a cross-sectional view through the spinal cord, and so this is a, a depiction of a disc herniation that's compressing the nerve root and it's causing pressure on the dorsal root ganglion, which sits in here. If it's the spinal cord right here, what, what level does the spinal cord end at? B12L1. So that disc herniation that I just showed you, that probably has to be like L1, L2 or T12 L1, right? To be, to have the cord sitting there. But people will all often come in um, saying that patients will come in worried about spinal cord compression. And if they have a herniated disc at L5 S1, are they getting spinal cord compression? No, no. Um, what's the, what is the end, the, the a name for the end point of the spinal cord. There's a name for it. It's not, it's not like, it's the conus medullaris. So that's that point where you'll see it on the MRI where the cord comes down to that little tapered area and, and then the nerves coming off it uh, are the nerve roots or the cauda equina coming off of it. Name for the horses horse's tail, right? Um, so what makes nerves hurt? So nerves hurt because they're compressed or inflamed, right? Or both. Most times it's both, right? Um, and when we're talking about nerve pain, do you get, if somebody clinically comes in and they, they're trying to figure out what they did to have their leg hurt, does it really matter? Most times it doesn't because the most times they don't really have an injury mechanism that would had had that not happened, it would have necessarily prevented um, them from having nerve root pain. Um, so injury mechanism probably doesn't really matter very much. Common scenario, low back starts hurting, then the low back feels a little bit better, and then they have leg pain. So that'll be sort of a normal peripheralization of symptoms. And so going back to that anatomic picture, this is a disc herniation, piece of disc sitting on the nerve, which would be causing a radiculopathy or radicular pain. And um, and we'll, we'll talk about the difference between those two here in a second. So let's just use an example. Let's just use an example of a radiculopathy. So describe the symptoms and signs of an L4 radiculopathy. What distribution would somebody have pain 
in an L4 radiculopathy. So lateral side, would you say medial thigh or anterior thigh? So they wouldn't come real far medial, it would stay more anterior. Um, so if you look at just, just a, and, and nobody's exactly like the books say. So here's an L4 root pattern wrapping around anterior thigh to the knee, to the shin, sometimes even to the top of the foot. Um, so these are just some dermatomes. I have no idea why that said next solutions. However, I like the pictures because I like the way they look. This is more of an L3 pattern, which comes a little more medial. L2 would be very medial like adductor area and maybe groin. L1 would be mostly groin and then just a lateral view showing anterolateral thigh. If it's more lateral thigh, it's probably L5 or S1, basically. If it goes to the big toe, L5. So, so most, most disc herniations will, will herniate sort of in this paracentral area right, right here. And so that'll affect the nerve root that goes below. So this one would affect the L5 root coming down before it comes out the neural foramen at L5-S1. So if we're targeting that level with an injection, I typically will target the L5 root and the medicine hopefully would flow back up to the L4-5 level. And so most disc herniations or protrusions occur in a paracentral location, most commonly. Name the two common things that can compress a spinal nerve. Disc herniations one, what else can compress a spinal nerve? The sex. Mm -hmm. So osseous or disc, less common, um, less common would be would be a facet cyst. So bone compression or lumbar disc herniation. So this is a lumbar L5 S1, just showing a fairly typical looking disc herniation. And that's more of a paracentral and it's affecting the S1 root as it descends. This is a disc herniation, it's a foraminal herniation, so that's a sagittal image at L4-5, and all that is disc, all that. If you look at it on another view, on an axial view, you'll see all this is that piece of disc sitting out here. These are bad looking facet joints too, so there's probably more compression from the disc but they, the two can collaborate. That's the L, L4 root on the other side right here. Can't even see it on the left. So, so location of compression matters. So whether it's something in the foramen or more centrally in the canal, it, it, it matters. So if, if it was in the foramen, it would affect the nerve root that just comes out of that foramen. So if it was like going back to, to this herniation, it, you would expect that herniation to really just affect the L4 root on that left side. Um, whereas if you go to this one, it, it would affect the S1 root as it descends. So position of the herniation does matter, uh, whether it's in the foramen or centrally, and, you know, where it, where it compresses also affects whether symptoms could be unilateral or bilateral, right? If it's out in the foramen, it should really only affect the side that it's on. But if it's in the center, you might see people with bilateral symptoms. So we, we, you'll always, you know, when you do a spine rotation, they'll always talk about cauda equina syndrome being an emergency and you need to act promptly or urgently. Um, so what are what are the components? What are some of the clinical components of Akata Aquina syndrome? 
Mm -hmm. So bowel bladder dysfunction, right? Other things? Those function. Average distribution is higher. So motor and sensory disturbance or, or impairment in their legs. Another common one would be saddle anesthesia. Um, they'll feel numb in their saddle area. So saddle anesthesia, bowel and or bladder dysfunction, um, progressive motor and sensory loss in their legs. Okay, Th those would be your red flags that you would you would worry about. Um, <clears throat> let's shift gears. We'll talk about lumbar discs as pain sources. So what what are the typical components of a lumbar disc on a very basic level? What is a disc made of? Annulus fibrosis and the nucleus pulposus, right? So so those are that's the normal stuff that makes up a disc. And just a typical disc, as you see, a side view here, the annulus back here, and the nucleus pulposus, right? So nucleus is more like a gel material. The annulus is more like a ligament. If you think of it in terms of, of that, the, the annulus does have nerves that, su that supply it. The nerve supply that supplies the outer third of the posterior annulus. Does anybody know the name of that? No, I, it's, it's a little esoteric. It's called the sinovertebral nerve. Um, and the sinovertebral nerve supplies the outer third of the of the annulus. And in a lot of for a long time, a lot of treatments were focused on this is a source of pain. And so we need to do something about this area. And so there were procedures that were were uh, were discovered or started were being utilized to ablate those nerves in the disc. Honestly, they never worked great. I, I think over time we've realized that th that might be part of why discs hurt. You get a little annular fissure back here, disrupts the nerves, but also the end plates might have something to do with that as well. So discs function to absorb compressive load, right? They act like a ligament to confer translational rotational stability. So part of thinking about discs is thinking about them almost like an ACL. They're, they're there to give some stability to that segment. So they help with translational stability and rotational stability. When a disc degenerates over time, then you lose stability. You might develop a spondylolisthesis. Um, the outer annulus is concentric rings. Um, that gives you sort of that rotational stability and translational stability. And disc degeneration is very important that it's that you understand that it's a norm. People get that as they get older. Um, the discs don't have a great deal of blood supply. So as we age, they dehydrate and they wear down. So so that's that's what happens with aging. Um, I always try to avert, avoid the term degenerative disc disease because it's not a disease. It's a condition that affects everybody as they get older. So, you know, people will come in and they'll say, oh, I have degenerative disc disease. My family doctor told me that. And technically, they're not wrong, but they're giving them a disease that is not unique to them. It's unique to being human. Um, asymptomatic people can have disc herniations. Good studies that show that in about 30% of the people, they're walking around with a disc herniation, not even aware that they have it. Um, so you always have to be careful when you get an MRI scan, you see two or three disc protrusions correlate that MRI with the symptom distribution because it may not, it may not be the source that not all three of them at least. So what is the most common structure injured in acute non-radicular low back pain episode? So somebody comes in and they're having back pain, they bent over, 
to tie their shoe and they stood up and now their back is killing them. What, what, what would you think about is the most common thing that caused that, that episode? Yep, annular tear. So more common, more common would be an annular fissure, annular tear. So that's the most common thing when you get this short, this, you know, somebody that comes in is just having a bad back pain episode. They might be bent over and they listed. So lumbar discs, think of it as a continuum from a bulge to a protrusion to an extrusion. So you can just have a bulge, then some disc material protrudes, and that can contact or compress to a compress a nerve, and then extrusion is a bigger, it's more of sort of that classic herniation where the material is out, actually outside of the confines of the disc. And as we talked about earlier, does mechanism of injury really matter? And the answer is probably not, because most of the people come in with really trivial, trivial events. Location matters. Is it paracentral or is it lateral? So it's paracentral is more common because of the posterior longitudinal ligament. And so discs will will protrude a little bit lateral to that, which puts them sort of paracentral. Um, we always want to educate patients when they come in with a disc protrusion or extrusion that the body does mount a response to degrade the herniation. It takes about 12 to 8 months, uh, 18. 12 to 18 months for herniated disc to show resorption on an MRI. That doesn't mean they have pain the whole time, but um, for it to actually look different. Um, and do disc injuries really heal? Like, do they get better and restore themselves? Not really. So once you've had a herniation, the disc never repairs itself um, to be normal again. Um, can we regenerate a disc? I think that's that's um, I, I agree. I say no too. I think that's that's controversial. You, you'll probably hear um, uh, read things about people using stem cells and things like that. And I don't think it's clear that they regenerate the disc as much as they might repair some fissuring in a disc. They don't grow it back in my and, and there's not I've never seen any evidence that they do. Um, so there's been a, tr a, tr a tremendous amount of treatments toward discs that have been failures, never really worked over time. I've tried every one of them. Um, IDET never worked. It was this coil that we put into the back of the disc and wrapped it around, and, and, it, and it was supposed to thermally ablate the sinovertebral nerve, never worked. Bioculoplasty, where we put two RF probes, one on each side of the disc, into the back of the annulus, Try to heat it up, didn't work, never worked. Decompressor, where you put this, this auger in the center of the disc and it went around in a circle and pulled disc material out. It was supposed to make the create negative pressure in the center of the disc and allow the disc material to slide back into the disc, never worked. So try, I tried them all when I was younger. Now, I, I've realized none of that stuff works. I don't do any of it anymore. Um, what are the most common activities and movements limited when a person has an acute disc pain syndrome? So they're going to come in and you're going to say to them, you know, what, what makes it hurt the most? Um, so a couple of things that clinically will clue you in to make maybe thinking disc pain. Flexion. And they'll often complain of inability to sit. So people that, that say, I'd rather get up and move around and walking makes me feel better. Think of disc. I don't like to sit and I can't bend forward. So muscles is the last thing I want to uh, touch on here. Um, so muscles um, can hurt, but I don't view them as the primary symptom generator for pain. Um, so muscles are usually secondary to something else causing the muscles to react. Um, 
So I guess the question is, do you really believe in a lumbar strain where, you know, you'll you'll hear an athlete will be out for a lumbar strain. Did they really just injure their muscles? What do you think? Secondary the muscles are probably some, some, something else did it. They might have muscle pain, but that just dealing with the muscle alone isn't probably going to solve their their problems. So I, it's not that we shouldn't treat their muscle symptoms, but that's probably not driving the 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 muscles. There's some underlying driver or originator of pain. Muscles are in multiple layers in the spine, as you know, have very short lever arms, and and in clinic, I'll rarely focus on muscle alone as being a source of pain. Um, you can see atrophy in the paraspinals just normally with aging, but especially in people that have fusions. So if you look at their MRI, you'll see they won't have a lot of paraspinal muscle at the fusion levels. Um, uh, in the old days, it might have been from cutting into muscle. Now, with some of the techniques that Dr. Braxton uses, he doesn't really disrupt the muscle as much. So it's it's probably more from immobility, right? Um, people will come in and commonly will say my 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 hip hurts, and that, that's a common sort of presentation. And so you should always ask them where their pain is because their hip, as you guys should know, is not in their butt. It's their groin usually, right? So people think when they when they come in, they'll point to their butt. And I would say the 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 uh, the vast majority of patients come in with some form of buttock pain. Um, in addition to back pain, and some just come in only with buttock pain. Um, so is it more common for the gluteal pain to originate in the hip or referred from the spine? Spine. So when somebody comes in and they have butt pain, um, they're gonna they're gonna be wondering, is it just related to the muscles in my butt? And and it can be, but it's more likely the spine that's referring to the butt. So gluteal pain, because it is so common in my clinics. Um, Understanding that it's usually referred via lumbosacral nerves. SI joint can be a source of buttock pain. Um, other things can be proximal hamstring tears. Look at pain in the ischial tuberosity area. Bursitis can present with sort of generalized lateral hip and into the buttock. Um, I have seen some people where they truly did have hip arthritis. They had groin pain too, but their butt was bothering them. You treated their hip. And, the, and their butt did improve. And then, and then muscles in the butt can make pain, but more likely than not, most of it's referred from lumbar issues. Um, name the two, name your two favorite muscles that cause gluteal pain. Piriformis, do you have any other ones that can cause butt pain? So quadratus femoris and piriformis. So I, I, I think piriformis syndrome is real. I think you can have pain related to that muscle, even the quadratus femoris. Um, and it can cause sciatica type symptoms. And um, but I don't I don't think you jump to that as your initial diagnosis until you've excluded other other causes of butt pain. So this is just showing your piriformis muscle here. In proximity, in proximity to this blue thing, which is your sciatic nerve. So people can have sciatica related to piriformis irritation. Quadratus femoris is this muscle down here. And that, and that can be a, a, a irritant also of the sciatic nerve. They talk about, you'll see an MRI talking about this space between the the ischial tuberosity and the um, and the femur, and there can be some impingement in there. Uh, I don't I don't honestly know how common that is. Um, I have had patients where we've excluded everything else and you're sort of left with looking at their at those muscles as being sources of pain. Um, and if if that's the case, 
sometimes I'll send them to Dr. Nurki to do an ultrasound guided injection um, uh, to, to try, try to localize that. Um, that's all I got. Any questions? to herniated disc on the PowerPoint, it was HNP. Mm -hmm. What does that stand for? Herniated nucleus pulposus. All right. If there's no questions. If there's anything from outside. Okay. Awesome.